I want to take the opportunity to to thank everybody. Uh, Diana, nice to meet you. <laughs> Diana Berent, who is uh, uh, the, her her passion and compassion and commitment to raising awareness to the needs of patients, right? With with COVID and long COVID, very patient focused in her in her activism and and uh, and a just tremendous amount of passion that she's put into becoming a voice and and providing leadership to this important part of the experience as as we all learn to live uh, with pandemic uh, viruses and so on. So Diana, why why don't you? Uh, Start out. Just give us a little background and and uh, a little a little insights to some of the work that you're doing. I think we have a lot of people that probably have, do not know about you and your work. So we're going to all be very uh, very excited to to learn more tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. And uh, obviously, any event that benefits Survivor Corps is um, an event that I want to be at and to be promoting because uh, we are doing God's work, if I do say so myself. Um, okay, let me give you a little bit of background on how um, someone who hasn't taken science since high school ended up being a subject matter expert in the middle of a pandemic because it's not a story that you might anticipate. Um, in early March of 2020, I was living in New York. Um, the hotbed of COVID at the time, at the start of things. And I got infected on March 9th at a meeting. Um, there were 10 people there, all 10 were infected. One of the people at the meeting had been at one of the original super spreader events at the Sheridan Hotel in New York City from March 2nd to March 7th. Everyone at the March 9th meeting was infected. We were all being very careful to not touch our faces and washing our hands, but um, the windows were closed. So um, we you know, were not aware at that point, or I was certainly not aware, I should say, that it was airborne, aerosolized. Everyone was infected. One person died two weeks later. Um, I woke up on Friday the 13th, March 2020, you can script it, with every symptom in the book. And I am not a hypochondriac by any means, but I am a news jun junkie. And so I had been following this, you know, virus from China going through Europe, through Italy, um, really, you know, following its every move. And I just had this sneaking suspicion, this is it. And I don't know how I, a, I was a professional photographer at the time, how basically a lacrosse mom on Long Island became patient zero, but I was convinced that I could have in that in those interim four days. And I didn't know at that point where I'd been infected and I didn't know how long the incubation period was. And so I didn't know how long I'd been infectious. And I was concerned that I was patient zero for my town. Um, and so I was highly motivated to get tested as a public health effort. And I wrote a post on Facebook, you know, which ended up going viral by the next morning, which had never happened to me in anything I had ever posted before. It reached the attention of my congressman who ordered me a test, um, not a scalable solution, by the way. And I tested positive. Um, I had gone into isolation within minutes of waking up on that Friday morning with symptoms, grabbed my laptop, went into my bedroom, and I stayed there for 18 days. I had um, what is considered a mild case of COVID. Um, when I say that, that means because I, anything that is not hospitalized is considered mild. So I had mild COVID pneumonia. I had mild COVID encephalitis, um, not the general definition of mild that you and I would use in common day language. Um, I was not tired, bizarrely. I had actually manic energy um, during that time. And, you know, that's sort of the short version of how I started Survivor Corps. Um, but while I was in isolation, I became obsessed with convalescent plasma. And the idea that my body had mounted an antibody response like it was supposed to, and that I, those antibodies, 
lived in my plasma, which is, if you're not familiar, when you spin blood out, it's the sort of amber translucent part of your blood. It's spun out with the centrifuge and the rest of your red and white blood cells, what we're used to thinking of as blood, the red part gets put right back in your body. And they spin off the plasma and literally inject it into somebody who has not been able to mount that antibody defense. And it's a form of therapy that started in the 1890s um, in use against diphtheria. The Nobel Prize was won for it in 1901, and it has been used throughout the last century for um, you know, everything from Ebola to um, MERS, SARS, you, know, you name it, it's been used um, throughout the last century. And it is, while crude and effective first line therapeutic if you don't have adequate or appropriate um, treatments, therapeutics. So I realized that if I was going to be one of the first survivors of this you know, pandemic already, New York City was shut down, it was on fire. Um, while I was in isolation, you know, all of the reports were coming from outside of hospitals with freezer trucks for corpses. It was a full on disaster. It was a hellscape in New York at the time. And the idea that I could, you know, again, I haven't taken science since high school. It's not like I could don my white coat and go help out in any sort of, you know, space substantively, but I could donate my plasma and I could save lives. And I felt that there was a moral imperative if I was going to be one of the first survivors to coalesce a, an army of survivors. Um, so I started Survivor Corps with three missions. One was to mobilize an army of survivors to donate their plasma. Second was to for that army of survivors to be partnering with science and medicine. Basically, I wanted to create a registry from the beginning of who had had COVID. So, you know, I offered myself as a up as a guinea pig. So not only, oh, I'll go back to that in one second. So hold that thought. Mm -hmm. And the third piece was, and this one did not work out, but it was a good idea. Um, the night, I started on March 24th, 2020. The night of March 23rd, 2020, Mark Zuckerberg did a Facebook Live with Dr. Fauci. I got the last question in of the night, which was what is the presumed durable immunity um, from this COVID-19 virus? And Dr. Fauci's response was, we presume that it will be like other coronaviruses and give you at least a year or so. You're probably good. So based on that, the third element that I proposed, that I wanted to be a part of Survivor Corps was that it would be a volunteer force. So those of us who had immunity, we could, you know, when there were no N95s available for the doctors and the nurses, we could go volunteer and help out in the ICU. I mean, obviously not performing any medical services, but people were needed. And if we were could do that without being a drain on PPE, that to me seemed to make all the sense in the world. And even if it wasn't doing things as dramatic as that, we could be getting groceries for the elderly so that they could stay home. Um, and it is for that reason that I named it Survivor Corps, um, but I named it after the Peace Corps, that I imagined that this could be the Peace Corps of our generation. And it has been just not in the way I anticipated. Um, going back to the partnering with medicine and science and uh, turning myself into a guinea pig, um, I was patient 0001 at Columbia, um, at Columbia University, where not only was I, did I get, I, I did not get my original test there, I got my original test in urgent care out on Long Island, but um, I, it was highly unusual, as everyone knows, to get a true PCR test that was working, available and accurate at the time, which I did, but I was probably one of the only people, if not the only person to get tested on the back end of the virus twice. 
at Columbia, because at that point, remember, we had no idea when people cleared the virus. And we'll get into, I think, a conversation, a lengthier conversation about viral persistence to see when you actually clear the virus. This was um, done at a, are you infectious still stage? So, um, and it was interesting, it took 21 days for me to test negative on a PCR, which ended up being probably average. And I received the first antibody test, um, I believe in the world. I received uh, Dr. David Ho's antibody test at Columbia. And I was, I believe the first, if not the first, one of the very first plasma donors. Um, I donated my full allotted eight times. Um, the first donation went to scientific research and the subsequent seven all went to patient transfusion. Um, so fast forward, you know, I start this group and it starts out as like the tinder of plasma. Right. So people are posting, you know, my dad's on a ventilator in Miami. He's, you know, AB negative who can donate. Um, as I said, I was, I am AB positive blood type and um, it's a little quirky thing about blood and plasma, but the matches are totally the opposite. So um, while I'm a universal recipient on blood, I am a universal donor for plasma. So as the doctors told me at the time, my plasma was like liquid gold. And I had people offering to pay me to travel around the country to donate my plasma. That's where things were, because at that time we couldn't, it was not, um, you couldn't ship plasma across state lines. So in April of 2020, the Mayo Clinic was given the, um, was put in charge of the emergency access protocol for plasma. And which was a huge relief for us because, you know, Tinder of plasma on Facebook, not awesome. Not a great solution in the, you know, in a pandemic. So the Mayo Clinic took up that charge and did it amazingly well. I, say this over and over again, there are very, very few things we have done right during this pandemic um, that the plasma EAP was one of them. Um, and what we saw is within about a month that many of our members were not recovering. And that was startling. And I felt much better for a while. I had a full symptomatic relapse over that summer of 2020. I went through Mount Sinai's post-COVID care center. I will say in retrospect that I do not believe I had long COVID. I believe that we are looking at a somewhat problematic um, definition of long COVID. And I think that it needs to be viewed through a more temporal lens. So what I, I believe I had a prolonged recovery. Encephalitis, swelling of the brain takes a really long time to go down. Um, infl the massive inflammation in the body takes a long time to go down. Um, what I see as the, the cases of long COVID that are more, they're true long COVID that are concerning to me are the ones where people are presenting with novel symptoms in the post-infectious stage. Note that I do not say post-acute because for a lot of these folks, the acute stage is happening after the infectious stage. Their worst symptoms are coming on, you know, at week three, week four, week six, week 12, and those sorts of symptoms. And I want to get beyond the brain fog and fatigue um, in this conversation. We're seeing massive pain. Um, we are seeing people with Parkinsonian-like tremors, um, neuropathy that it almost mimics you know, advanced diabetes, um, a sense of internal vibrations in the chest cavity and elsewhere um, that would be referred to as akathisia if it was medicinally induced, but I haven't met a physician yet who has seen it in this way, not prompted by some new medication. And so what's you know, how do we know how to solve akathisia? You take away the offending medication, but if it's happening de novo, you know, people are really at a loss on how to treat these symptoms. And I want to focus on those just, but in joint pain, tremendous joint pain. Um, 
the one the one symptom that does that actually does start the the one exception here are the gastro issues those start at the beginning and can be sustained and get worse and worse and worse so that's an exception to my definition i haven't figured out how to work that in um but that you know i i certainly had terrible gi issues and we knew so little about covid when i had it in march of 2020 that i had to get to page 4 of google scholar before I found one study from Wuhan that said that, you know, out of 12 people who had COVID, two had diarrhea. That was literally it. I thought that I was so unlucky that I was patient zero for this pandemic and I had a stomach flu on top of it. You know, how crazy is that? Well, obviously it was too crazy to be real because it wasn't real. It was part of COVID. Um, but that just sort of shows you how little we knew at the time. And um, so, yeah, uh, now we are, we're two and a half years later and um, the world has sadly woken up to long COVID. Um, have we responded appropriately? No, um, but the massive numbers of people who are suffering can't be ignored. And the one thing I wanna say about that is we should not have been surprised. Uh, we are living in a historical bubble if we were not anticipating this. I, I use this, um, this story a lot, but there's a reason why. Um, so hear me out. In 2005, Oliver Sacks wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times warning about the avian flu because of the people who would die, no. In fact, it was more, you know, more deadly. So it's a good thing, a good thing we sort of got spared that one. But he was actually warning about the neurological sequela. And he said that there has not been a an influenza um incident, you know, a influenza epidemic not followed by neurological sequela since the time of Hippocrates. Now let that sink in. And then think about long COVID and your physician who doesn't believe you or doesn't realize that, you know, even the flu can, you know, the flu can lead to tremendous problems in the body afterwards. It's just, you know, I can only speak from my own experience, but I believe I've had the flu twice in my life. I know people have had COVID three times this year alone, four times. You know, we are not used to continue this continual onslaught um, to our bodies. So I think that looking at this from a historical perspective and instead of looking at long COVID as a mystery, I think it's a better idea to see what is familiar here. What are the threads we can, what are the strands we can tease out that we've seen before in other contexts and why why did they happen and how were they resolved if they were resolved um and start thinking about what we can do as opposed to everything we can't oh that's that's just i mean it's so startling to realize um that everything was so transactional in whether you were tested positive, negative, and meanwhile, it was uh, camouflaging the real, you know, the real reality that the, the sustainability of the disease of the virus was continuing, you know, for so many people. And I love this, just, just uh, thank you so much for that, you know. I think it'd be great for us to bring Dr. Galland in, uh, Dr. Leo Galland, he's gonna join us now. How are you? Great, thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, we we'll just wanna segue over to you, doctor, because um, uh, if you could just share a little bit of your background and then uh, we could get right to it um, because we're so interested sure. in our view of, of the, uh, from an integrative medicine point of view of what are, where are we? What is the landscape? What are the medicinal options that we have, you know? Um, sure. Um, I'm an internist, a practicing physician in Manhattan, and um, over the past 40 years or so, I've kind of specialized in um, trying to help people who have complex chronic conditions that um, are sometimes considered mysterious and certainly multifactorial. And in trying to help these patients, I've 
um, I've looked at many different aspects of function, biological, psychosocial, and have developed a, a way of thinking about illness that's different than the way that I was trained. And I was, I, I was trained at NYU Medical School and Bellevue Hospital. I mean, it was a, it was a very good conventional training in internal medicine. Um, and um, along the way, treated a lot of patients with Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, January of 2020, when it was clear that this new infection was going was had traveled outside China, I realized that I really needed to understand it, not because I anticipated what was going to happen, but because I thought, well, my patients are going to have a lot of questions. And um, back during that flu epidemic that Oliver Sacks sent that letter about, I looked into steps that people could take to um, self-help measures to prevent flu that had been uh, shown to work in controlled clinical trials that involved natural products. And there were several. And I, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat that. I'm gonna start looking at coronaviruses. Uh, I'm gonna look at SARS and MERS and the precursors of COVID-19. And um, I, every day since then, this is over two and a half years, I have reviewed the literature in addition to my medical practice. I have spent time, at least an hour, each day and sometimes more, uh, sometimes several hours reviewing the medical literature and, put, and trying to make sense of it and trying to develop an understanding of what is happening with this virus when it, affects your, when it infects your body and um, what are the different complications and what can be done about it. And my focus has been on self-help measures. Uh, although I am now trying to develop a training program for physicians because, uh, and there were several things that, um, that Diana said that I think are really relevant here. Um, the way that the media treats long COVID is, oh, it's this mysterious disease and we don't know anything about what causes it. Um, that just creates fear. We know a lot about what causes long COVID. We know a lot about the interactions that underlie it and they are, most of them are actionable. And, and I think that's the level on which it needs to be discussed. Um, the problem with the uh, academic medical centers, and there are places doing really top research uh, that I think is really valuable. And I've had patients consult me who have been to those centers, and they all basically say the same thing. Well, I went there and to be part of the research study, but I really wanted to be treated. And what I was told is, well, we're not treating anybody based on this research. We're just treating symptoms. And that is a big problem. And I told one of my patients that, and she said, well, what else is new? Because that is the way that conventional medicine is organized. It's you identify the disease and then you treat the disease. The approach of integrated medicine and especially the functional medicine component is that independent or not totally dependent on what the disease is, you look at the disordered physiology that underlies the condition in, in each person and you try to figure out what can this person do or what can I do with or for this person? And I prefer the with because I things work best when there's a partnership between the physician and the patient. Uh, what can be done to correct that disordered physiology? Um, and so I started to become aware of the existence of long COVID probably April of 2020. There were reports coming out. I was in New York at the same time Diana was, and it was, well, you, you were maybe there, Lou. I mean, it was, yeah. Oh, yeah. it was surreal. Oh, I mean, it, it was, um, it was the hospitals were surreal. full and the streets were empty. No, it um, very, it, especially in, I mean, it, it, it was very surreal. Sure. Yeah, it really was. It was so the um, about June of 2021, I put um, everything that I could um, think of related to long COVID together into a couple of presentations. One I, I gave to a group of physicians and posted it online. It's on Vimeo. Um, and the other one was intended for patients. 
And um, I've continued to follow this research and try and organize it. Um, and there's a concept that I came up with about six months ago to explain all the different aspects of things that were going on. I, I call it the web of long COVID, and I'll say something about that in a moment. But I wanted to respond to a couple of things that Diana said. Uh, I think there are several patterns that we see, and I'm not certain that the patterns necessarily each reflect a different physiology. It may be that there's a shared physiology that produces different outcomes. And the patterns include the people with what Diana called prolonged recovery, except there's kind of like no recovery for them. They get sick and they don't really get better. And um, then there are the people who have a mild illness or they seem to get well, and then they relapse. And the relapse may be with symptoms similar to what they had, or it may be a totally new set of symptoms. And those can come and go and they can amplify over time. And, and, and then there are the people who, um, who develop something during the six or 12 months after having COVID that is recognized as a disease or a condition, um, which may or may not have its root in whatever COVID did to their body. Um, the incidence of diabetes, high blood pressure, um, cardiovascular problems, neurologic disorders, psychiatric disorders. It, it's all about twice as high in people who have had COVID. And, and independently of that, whether or not people know that, that they haven't fully recovered, there are changes in the, in the brain on MRI that, that is shared by a group, by this group. I won't say that everybody's going to show them, but it's some, a very... Um, carefully done study in the UK. They took people who had had MRIs before the pandemic and repeated them uh, after a year or two later during the pandemic, matched people uh, for free. Of course, it was a research study and matched people who had had COVID with people who hadn't. And as a group, the people who had had COVID had a lot of disturbed changes in the, in the brain MRI. Um, those happened to correlate on a group basis again with the kinds of um, cognitive uh, disturbances that people often experience after COVID-19. But um, there's definitely something in, the, in what COVID does in your body, in your brain, in your circulatory system, to your immune system that sets people up for, uh, for problems that are gonna occur once they seem to be over the infection. And um, maybe, uh, uh, doctor, they'd be maybe they're predisposed even genetically, right? To for, for those types of uh, uh, diseases to manifest, right? But their immune system has been uh, depleted or you know depressed. Possibly, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the patients that have consulted me had problems before they got COVID, but I've seen people who who appeared to be really healthy. They had great diets, they were physically fit, um, and they really were kind of devastated by the infection and had not recovered a year later. Um, a, a colleague of mine in the UK believes that he can predict who's going to get long COVID and who can't um, from their GI function prior to COVID. I, I'm not convinced that that's, I mean, that's one factor. It's not the only factor. Um, the uh, something that Diana said about flu epidemics being followed by neurologic disease. The pandemic of 1918, um, the so-called Spanish flu, which actually originated in Kansas on a horse farm and was spread around the world by a, an American soldier who went to Europe in World War I. Um, that was followed by um, neurologic disturbances that were described in Oliver Sacks's book, Awakenings, which was turned into a movie. The incidence of that kind of problem called van economos encephalitis peaked four years after the epidemic ended and continued, and new cases appeared for 10 years, for 10 up until years. 1928, wow. there were new cases of this. So wow. we have not yet seen, unfortunately, I'm afraid, the, the, the consequences of this pandemic, the, 
the full the full set of consequences that might occur, especially neurologically. Um, the um, so in in working through this this understanding of, of what's going on, I came up with about ten different factors that um, I put together into this diagram of the web of long COVID. Now, there are probably more than 10. It's not perfect. But when I looked for a spider web on Google, I could only come up with one that had eight strands. All the others didn't look very good. So I figured, okay, we've got eight strands, but I wanted a couple of things in the center that I thought were central. Um, and, and there are two things right at the center. One is a deficiency of this vital enzyme called ACE2, which is the gateway through which the virus enters most cells, and ACE2 is impaired or destroyed by viral cell entry. And the loss of ACE2 has um, just this cascading effect on the circulatory system, the immune system, the ability to repair, heal, and recovery, and on the nervous system. Um, and in particular, in the nervous system, uh, the maybe aside from brain fog, the most disabling and the commonest neurologic disturbance, POTS, um, can be traced to a deficiency of ACE2, at least based on laboratory studies in, in animals. And, um, and then around that is mitochondrial dysfunction um, because damage to ACE2 creates damage to mitochondria, which are the centers and cells that generate about 90% of the body's energy. Yeah, and they're really important. Yeah, it'd be great for you to, to just define that one more time, the, the, those cells. I think it'd be really helpful. The, oh, you mean the, the two know. central? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, yeah, okay. right. So the central, what I consider the, the real center, the, and real, I mean, every, every strand of this web is, crea is connected to every other strand. And there is no, which ones are more important and how they group depends on the individual person. There are dyads and triads of connectivity, but right at the center is damage to a vital enzyme called ACE2 that occurs when the virus enters cells. It attaches to ACE2. That's been shown to cause damage to ACE2 in studies that were done at Scripps. Um, and, um, and the consequence of, of that it, uh, I mean, there's so many things that can come out of that, the blood clots, the excessive inflammation, um, the problems in the lungs. Uh, ACE2 is so important in healing from the acute respiratory, respiratory distress issues, syndrome. Res respiratory issues. Respiratory, cardi um, vascular, cardiac, immune, um, healing, uh, abnormal scarring called fibrosis. Uh, they're all impacted by ACE2. And there are a number of ways to boost ACE2 levels, the, um, and ACE2, the, the hit that ACE2 takes gets passed on to the mitochondria in the cells. And um, now there are other things that happen that may damage the mitochondria beyond the damage to ACE2, but it's a kind of a, you know, it's a domino effect. It's like this cascade. And mitochondria are so vitally important for energy they, they not, not only impact the brain, where they're very important, and the muscular system, where they impact um, physical energy, they, they're important for energy in all cells. So the blood vessels, when, the, when there's mitochondrial damage, take a second hit. And they're very important for the immune system. The immune system needs a lot of energy to function properly, and mitochondrial dysfunction tilts the way the immune system responds. So the hyperinflammation that's been described, um, ACE2 contributes, mitochondrial dysfunction contributes, and, and there are other things that happen. Radiating out from that web, and, and, and there are ways to support mitochondrial function and, and help recovery. Radiating out from the center are these spokes of the web that go out to the, to the, to the periphery, to the corona. Around the outside is organ damage. Um, and, and that can involve the brain, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, the adrenal glands, um, the peripheral nervous system, uh, the, uh, the skin, um, in, and the GI tract. The strands that radiate out as a result of this problem 
involve number one, and it's not even, I'm numbering them, but this is just going around the clock. Yeah, and I yeah. put it that way for convenience. Right. Right. Inflammation to the lining of blood vessels called uh, endothelitis, which is a very um, important occurrence. And it's found after alleged recovery from COVID-19 um, lasting for months, even in people who aren't particularly symptomatic. Um, these are indirect measures. That's hard to measure directly. Then there, there are these microclots, which are very closely related to the endothelitis because the inflamed endothelium, especially in small vessels like capillaries, creates the clotting. I mean, it, it's a, it provokes the clotting, but the clotting aggravates the damage to the blood vessels. So it's a vicious, it's a feed forward loop. There are, immune, there are a whole series of immune defects that, are occur, that occur, and I'm not gonna go into them now, but they include activation of mast cells and excess release of histamine, um, autoantibody formation, um, the disturbances in, in certain kinds of white blood cells, uh, something called monocytes, which become which start malfunctioning, and especially T lymphocytes, which are really important for recovery from viral illness. And so there's T lymphocyte dysfunction. So that's about two thirds of, of the spokes of the web. The other two, maybe it's three quarter. Well, anyway, <laughs> the, the other two spokes, there is a disturbance in the composition of the gut microbiome the microbes that live in the gut. And this has been pretty well described. Um, even in people who don't necessarily have GI symptoms, but you can bet that it's going to be there big time in people who do. Um, there's a loss of certain protective bacteria. There's an overgrowth of undesirable bacteria. And, um, and there's the, the loss of protective bacteria leads to the, the um, loss of substances that these bacteria produce that are Im important not only for the large intestine and the small intestine, but they're absorbed systemically and they affect your immune system, your metabolism, and your brain. The healing fluids, you know, <laughs> the healing, yeah. right? the, the things well, that yes. keep it healthy. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. There are a lot of products of health. I mean, we need these healthy bacteria. Of course. They, of course. they feed us. Okay. And then there's the issue of viral persistence, um, which is really, I would say the most exciting research that's come out in the past few months has, has been research indicating persistence of viral proteins in the body and pointing to the fact that the virus may actually be continuing to live and replicate. And I think the most, what, what struck me as the strongest argument for this was a study from Harvard where they took plasma, they didn't even take cells, they just took the, 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 clear, the clear amber colored blood plasma of people who had, had, who had long COVID uh, for up to a year, and they could identify viral proteins with their assays in this plasma. And the author said, there has to be a reservoir of active viral infection for this to occur. Most of the researchers think that's in the gut. And so those two strain, uh, strands, the disturbances in the gut microbiome and viral persistence probably related um, and probably linked to the T cell dysfunction uh, that occurs. And the, it's just a question of what or what, what is creating what um, Doctor, is one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, uh, can you tie this in then for us in the, those of us um, really trying to understand this, this definition of the long COVID, right? It, 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 which starting to sound as if it's a series of continuing manifestations of disease within the body. But how, how would you help us, guide us to understanding the, you know, the takeaway of long COVID specifically, you know, if you okay. can, you know? Right, it, first of all, let me just say that all chronic illness and possibly all illness is the result of a series of interrelated disturbances that occur involving external triggers, environmental factors, internal factors, which may be acquired 
or a genetic and the way that they interact. The way that modern medicine likes to function is by naming diseases. So you said, can you, you know, like, oh, this disease is long COVID. This is the definition of long COVID. This is another disease. This is diabetes. This is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh Uh, That's the way medical education and research is organized. Yes. It it leaves a lot to be desired. And um, especially when it comes down to practice and treating real patients. I mean, I was trained in that. You know, I I was well-trained in that approach. And, you know, back 40, 45 years ago, I realized there's a lot that this doesn't explain in the patients that I'm seeing in real life. And there has to be a better way of trying to understand um, what is making people sick and how can they reverse the illness that they have. And I, I eventually published and described an approach that I called person-centered diagnosis as opposed to disease-based diagnosis. And, and, and the principles, those principles are the ones that I bring to try and help people with well, that, long that, COVID that, and, I and think, take I them... Think- I think our guests, you know, need to understand that that's where you have really been quite innovative and, you know, I think, you know, more and more admired over, over the, the course of your career um, of, of, of seeking that, those answers, you know? Well, well I mean, what, yeah, fortunately, um, the idea, I mean, when I started doing this stuff, a, a lot of people thought I was pretty out there and which didn't bother me because I don't care about that. I just care about the results that I get. But virtually 90% of the things that I thought were important wound up becoming mainstream. The importance of omega-3 fats back in the 80s um, was something that I was working with. And by the mid 90s, that had started to become mainstream. Trace minerals, magnesium and zinc. in the 90s, I got really involved in the importance of, the, of gut microbes and their impact on systemic health and immunity and carry, have carried that research through um, and its clinical application up into the pandemic. You know, and then about 15 years ago, that started to become mainstream. Um, I, I think the limitations of a disease-centered model are, ver- are becoming clearer and clearer. And long COVID, is kind of, could be, I mean, mean, that is a real example of the limitations of a disease-centered model. Um, What we're talking about is disordered physiology that occurs after COVID-19 that can have a variety of presentations. Two people can have similar presentations and different physiology. Two people can have different present, um, similar I'm sorry, I got a little lost in my, meta, in my discussion there. Either similar manifestations in different physiology or different manifestations in similar physiology. And I've seen that over and over again with chronic fatigue syndromes and, and other types of, of chronic ailments. Doctor, let's let, uh, Diana, could we bring you in? You know, do you, you want to uh, bring in a few questions? You know, we have uh, quite a few coming, starting to, you know, be in the in the queue, but why, why don't we turn it over to you and let you um, ask some questions and have some exchange? Um, I'm going to start with a really basic question, although there are some brilliant questions in the chat that are worth reviewing and um, and hitting you with, Dr. Gallen. But the where I, I'm going to start just at the very beginning. Let's say I have I have really bad long COVID, right? I I come to you. What are you assessing? I, I want to. I'd like to hear what are you. What kind of tests are you running? What are you looking for? G- give us sort of like walk us through a a couple of um, hypothetical patients in what you how you're testing what you're testing for how you're doing it and what you're finding. I mean, okay. so the idea of basically being can people take from this questions to ask their doctors about sure. their doctors. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Some of the things that I talk about are hard to measure. It's really hard to measure ACE2 activity outside of a laboratory, for example. Um, It's very hard to measure mitochondrial function 
directly. Uh, there is one company that's doing it. I'm I'm looking at, at at the results that I'm getting. I'm not ready to advocate that people go out and get that testing done. So I do look at symptoms and I look at the trajectory of the illness. I mean, so there's art in there. It's not just science. Um, it is possible to look at blood clotting and both Quest um, and all of the commercial labs do offer tests that can, that can look at microscopic blood clotting. And by the way, um, if, I if I were to run this test on someone who just recovered from COVID and maybe thinks that they're feeling really well, there's a good chance they're gonna show evidence of abnormal blood clotting in, in the recovery period. Um, D-dimer is the one that, that has gotten the most attention, um, but there are things like thrombin, antithrombin complexes, fibrin monomers, prothrombin fragments. You, if you go to Quest and you look at their thrombo thrombotic marker panel, you'll see it in there because um, the terms aren't going to be familiar to you. Um, so I look at, I look at that. Um, I, will, I may order cytokine testing, which Quest and LabCorp and the other major labs do. And of course, a lot depends on, I mean, is someone's insurance going to cover this? Can they afford to pay for this testing? Um, the cytokine panel gives me some insight into, um, uh, into the, the inflammatory chemicals that are traveling in their blood. I also do more general tests for inflammation like C-reactive protein. Um, and, um, and, and I look for evidence of autoimmunity. Now, probably the most important tests for autoimmunity are not commercially available yet in the US. But um, because these are novel autoimmune markers, but they, um, but I will run through um, an anti-nuclear antibody and especially something called an anti-phospholipid antibody panel, because these auto, these are probably the most common abnormal um, of the conventional antibodies in people who have had COVID are the anti-phospholipid antibodies, and they do impact on circulation, uh, and in fact. There's a study that showed that coenzyme Q10, which is one of the mainstays for mitochondrial function, can actually improve the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I actually, this is CoQ10, correct? Yeah. So I actually just ran a poll within Survivor Core on whether or not people are seeing if that's helpful. And it was a resounding yes from our- Yeah, of, of all of the treatments that you can give somebody shortly after COVID or even further on after COVID, who's complaining of physical fatigue, CoQ10 ranks number one. You need a fairly high dose. You have to get up to 100 milligrams a day will not do it. You need 200 to 400 milligrams a day, usually divided doses um, taken with food is the way that I administer it. And there are some other supplements that may help the CoQ10 work better. Um, I mean, we don't really have time to go into the complexities of mitochondrial function. Um, but probably the best okay. thing <laughs> to use with CoQ10, <laughs> the, the thing that the best thing to use with CoQ10 is vitamin B3 in one form or another. Um, for two reasons. One, B3 gets depleted through different, a couple of different mechanisms during acute COVID. And also it is the essential cofactor for the first step in mitochondrial energy generation along with CoQ10. Um, so um, you know, I might look at specific um, nutrients, a low vitamin A. Uh, vitamin D is important. I certainly want to make sure that there's, that the levels are adequate. I may measure them. Uh, when, I've see, when I see vitamin A deficiency or, or some B vitamin deficiency, I will really emphasize that. Um, it's not about measuring CoQ10 in the blood, however, because maybe what's circulating is fine. You just need more. Maybe it, it, there are some studies in which when you damage cells, and mitochondria, the CoQ10 leaks out of the cells. So the blood level actually goes up and, and what you see in the blood isn't reflecting what's happening inside the cell. Um, uh, there, I am in conversations with a lab in uh, Virginia called Amerimmune that is developing, a, that has developed a panel, but is looking to expand that panel to find markers that might indicate viral persistence and that will be available through Quest, just not in New York or California, any other state. 
Well, we definitely um, want to, it's a, it's a good moment to encourage all of the guests to also look into the Tolovid um, formulation that Todos produces. It's a, it's a remarkable, we've, we've had great, great feedback and great testimonials uh, right. through the Alchemist Kitchen. So, so a word. Right. And that relates to two aspects. Thanks for bringing that up. One is the issue of viral persistence, which I think is pretty common. I, so far, I'm not quite sure who it, who, who has persistence of SARS-CoV-2 and who doesn't. I don't think there's a really reliable blood test. I often make that decision on a clinical basis. Um, Tolovid has been very helpful. In addition, it has certain specific anti-inflammatory effects of a type that can, um, that can boost antiviral immune defenses. Um, so it, it is definitely a contribution to the arsenal of treatments and one that I'm very happy to have. And Todos Medical is working with Amerimmune on this um, that's, that's advanced right. testing. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm really looking forward um, to that coming out. Um, uh, I, I've been really impressed with the people at both Todos Medical and Amerimmune um, just because of their um, commitment and honesty and lack of ego. Uh, um, I mean, they're not, they're not trying to prove something. They're not trying to defend a position that they took. They're really trying to help us find answers. Yeah, look for and, answers and a great commitment to research. And at the same time, uh, as you said earlier, doctor, you know, it's uh, kind of uh, the corona is like a mycelium of disease strains, you know, uh, for those, you know, for those of us that uh, love mycelium in the study of mushroom, um, you know, or organisms, you know, you kind of think of corona. I think, of, you know, of corona now is this kind of really crazy myriad of strains and, and manifestations that that you, how do you know when it's, you don't know when it's over. And, uh, and Well, that's and true. I, I, I thought that well, you know, it, it, the mycelial image is good, Lou. I, I kind of prefer the web because it's a little more organized. Mycelia are all over the place. <laughs> okay. and, but spiders really have to construct their web in, a, okay. in, in an organized way. I want to say one other thing about lab testing, by the way, because it relates to this issue of, to the issue of reactivation of viruses. Uh, I often look at Epstein-Barr virus antibody levels. Now, what is very clear from the research is that during acute COVID, many people experience what appears to be a reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus, EBV. Everyone in the world gets infected with EBV by about the age of 30. Once it gets into your body, it never leaves. It stays there in a dormant state for the remainder of your life. You shed it in your bodily secretions, which is how other people get it. Um, what keeps it under control are T lymphocytes, primarily. But the way that you measure it is by looking at antibodies. And everybody's going to show, should show, everyone over the age of 30 should show antibodies to two of the antigens to Ep uh, that are present in Epstein-Var virus. I, I, and I want to talk about this in maybe a little more detail than I would like to, simply because I've seen these antibody tests be misused and really scared people. So during the course of acute COVID, researchers have found that they can actually find the DNA of Epstein-Barr virus in the blood, which is a pretty good sign that it's gotten more active. The antibody levels go up. They, um, during the course of, and, and I've seen elevated Epstein-Barr virus antibody titers after COVID-19, like a month later, in people who feel as if they've totally recovered. So what's going on? Are the high antibody titers a result of active, reactivated EBV? I don't think so. Well, well I, don't want, I don't think EBV is the target treatment. I think that the reason these antibodies go up is because T cell immunity is impaired and the antibodies are the backup to the T cell immunity. About 40 years ago, there was a fascinating study, set of studies done at Ohio State University in students, medical students in particular. And they looked at Epstein-Barr virus immune responses. And at the end of summer vacation, uh, at the end of final exams, the antibody titers were really high and the cellular immunity, the T cell 
levels were really low. <laughs> At the end of summer vacation, it was the opposite. The <laughs> cellular immunity, the T cells were really active because they'd had the summer off, they weren't all stressed out, and the antibodies had dropped. So when your T cells take a hit with a, with a, with a virus like EBV that is being kept in a latent state by your T cells, yeah, the antibodies go up because the, the EBV isn't being suppressed the same way, gets kind of restless. So the backup immunity kicks in. I, I personally have not seen anyone with long COVID who benefited um, from treatment of Epstein-Barr virus with the kind of drugs that are used. And I, I really think, so I, I use it as an index of T cell uh, function, especially for the type of T cells that are involved in suppressing uh, EBV. Uh, and there's a whole, there's a lot. And actually the, the function of those T cells is very strongly influenced by what's growing in your gut, by the gut microbiome. Lactobacilli, the production of this beneficial uh, metabolite, which is called butyrate, they've all been shown to help um, T, this kind of T cell immunity. And this kind of T cell immunity is very important in the treatment of cancer. So it's been studied in that setting a lot. That's great. All right, look, we've got a big queue of questions. So I think sure. we should just okay. open can I start, it up. Can I start it off, oh, can I start sorry, off with a basic question on oh, sure. and and how that fits into this conversation, Dr. Sure. Gatland? So... Okay, oh, I get, I'm getting tons of reports from Survivor Corps members with long COVID who are finding great symptom relief from Tolovid. I take it before I anticipate a higher than, a higher level of risk than risk exposure that I'm comfortable with. Um, can you explain mechanistically how it works prophylactically in an, the acute stage and most pertinently in the long COVID? Stage. Well, I can, I can attempt to. I can tell you what, what I know about it. Um, and I've had some pretty lengthy discussions with, the, with people who, who have been involved with it in developing it. First of all, the active ingredient is an herb that's been commonly used in Chinese medicine for a long time and studied in Western medicine as well, uh, which goes by the name red gromwell root, yeah, um, root. lithospermium, um, <laughs> erythrorhizin, okay? And um, it's been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects and antiviral effects. Now it was selected because of its ability to inhibit an enzyme that the virus needs to survive in your body. That enzyme is called the main protease or 3CL protease. And the drug Paxlovid that Pfizer has marketed is a 3CL protease inhibitor. And actually it requires two drugs to, to get a sustained effect. Tolovid um, in part works by the same mechanism of, as Paxlovid. That is the ingredients in it are um, fairly potent inhibitors of 3CL protease. Um, there can be rebound after those inhibitors are stopped by the way, and it's true for Tolovid, it's true for right. that, was, that was actually one of my, that's my follow-up question, which I'll get in right now on Tolovid is, is it, you know, because I'm also, you know, are, are those symptoms going to be resolved in perpetuity or is it just for a period of time? And basically, are you, you know, how long are you taking this for? Is it getting rid of the virus or is it just stopping it from making more? Well, it's mostly, it's stopped... You know, what this main protease, what the virus needs the main protease for is its ability to avoid your immune system, uh, replicate itself, travel outside of cells. So it's not quite directly virucidal, um, but it disarms the virus to such an extent that it becomes an easy prey for your immune system. Um, the original idea and the recommendations in acute COVID are five days is pretty much the same as Paxlovid. For long COVID, um, they're recommending 10 days or 15 days now. And, um, uh, and, and I, I mean, you know, this is a new area where, so, so the first function of Tolovid uh, in long COVID is as part of a protocol for eliminating persistent virus, SARS-CoV-2 specifically. 
or other coronaviruses, because they all depend on that main protease, which has been called the Achilles heel of coronaviruses, the dependence on that. Um, the, there is another effect that Tolovid has, or that the red Gromwell root has. And we're, I think they're trying to figure out to what extent does Tolovid really have that. There are multiple anti-inflammatory effects. Um, there also is an effect on a combination uh, on, on a type of proteins called chemokines and the receptors for them. And I don't know if you followed the work of Bruce Patterson, who's gotten a lot of attention um, or created a lot of attention okay. uh, online. Uh, and, and basically the, the, the core of Patterson's findings, um, interpretation of his findings and, and recommended treatments is that there is a disturbance the disturbance that is creating the inflammation it occurs in cells called monocytes. That um, these are in, the, the monocytes are out of whack and they're out of whack because the chemicals that the monocytes respond to are out of whack. And so he's been recommending an anti-AIDS drug called Maraviroc to treat this imbalance. Well, it turns out that told of it that, that red Gromwell root has pretty similar effects to what Maraviroc does. Is that part of the mechanism of action? By the way, of the people who have been on Patterson's protocol, Maraviroc is the only component that I've seen really help anybody. I mean, it hasn't helped. There are a lot of people that it hasn't helped. But when someone has said, I did this protocol, it really made a difference. It was in response to Maraviroc. So there's another potential mechanism there. Um, dealing with these chemokine receptors. Uh, CCR5 is the one that Maraviroc targets, um, but there are a couple of others. So, so I, I think, and this is going to be true of virtually every natural product that, that I use or recommend, there are going to be multiple effects. I mean, the products that boost ACE2 activity or the substances that do, vitamin D, curcumin, resveratrol, they all have other effects beyond that are supportive of recovery beyond boosting ACE2 activity. Uh, resveratrol, for example, works with vitamin B3 to support mitochondrial function. It stimulates the kind of T cell um, function that you need to clear the virus. Uh, curcumin has general anti-inflammatory effects at multiple levels. All right, great. Diane, is that good? Can I, can I go to some of the chat, chat questions? Go for it. All right. Um, Dr. Gollin, let's see. So let's start at the beginning. You think Lyme and long COVID fatigue is the same type of fatigue? Um, well, it may be. I mean, there, there certainly, um, and by the way, I have a, um, I put a, a, a blog up on a website called Find a Top Doc or something. Um, and it was called the challenge of chronic Lyme disease. And I've done a lot of work with chronic Lyme over the years. I'm on the medical advisory board of the Global Lyme Alliance. And there are multiple factors involved in the fatigue of Lyme disease. Mitochondrial damage, probably from antibiotics is one of them. Or from, but, but I think a lot of the fatigue that occurs in people with an active infection is cytokine mediated. Um, and so it may be different cytokines. Yeah, there's an overlap. They're not identical. What, what, uh, Donna McCormick is asking, um, is there a possibility of a, link, of a link between long COVID and CFS? Uh, -E? ME. ME. Symptoms are she, similar. Um, well, part of them are similar and part of them aren't. And um, CFS ME has, is is a heterogeneous group of conditions that may have different triggers. I've only seen one study that was what's called a prospective study that looked at the development of CMF, CFS ME, it was done in a small city in Australia. And uh, th these researchers just took everybody who got an acute Epstein-Barr virus infection, which manifested as mononucleosis, or uh, another type of virus called Ross River virus in this whole city, and they followed them for like a year. And 
about 12 and a half percent, six months later, 12 and a half percent of those people had not recovered. Whether the symptoms that they had were very similar. So this was a very kind of stereotypical illness with, with fatigue, muscle pain, and brain fog. It was directly related to how sick they had been when they had the acute infection. Um, you can't say the same thing about long COVID. There, there are way too many manifestations, about 200 have been, and, and very different patterns. So yes, some people with long COVID will have a pattern that looks very much like CFSME. And in fact, the kind of microbiome disturbances described in long COVID have also been described in CFS. Right. So yeah, there's, there is overlap, yeah. but, but I don't think that CFS is a model for long COVID and I don't think long COVID um, is necessarily a model for CFS. Have you seen irregularities or are there irregularities in blood pressure that relate to COVID or long COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Now they take um, three different forms, I guess. Certainly, there are some people who developed high, bo- high blood pressure after COVID-19. Um, ACE2 is very important in, in blood pressure control. So that can probably be traced right to the kind of imbalance created by the ACE2 deficit. But that's not the reason that people are going to see doctors who specialize in long COVID. They're seeing their internist who says, oh, your blood pressure is high. Um, you know, you better take this medication or see a cardiologist. But that's, that's fairly common. Yeah. There are people who develop drops in blood pressure, low blood pressure. And um, there are two different types of low blood pressure. One is the person just has a lower blood pressure than they had pre-COVID. The other is what's called neurally mediated hypotension, which in English means that when you stand up, your blood pressure drops or orthostatic hypotension. And and it occurs not because you have a problem with your heart, but because of something happening in your brain. Now that actually is fairly common in CFSME. Uh, 35 years ago, that research was uh, published from Johns Hopkins. It's not so common after long COVID. Um, More common after long COVID is this Um, POTS syndrome, positional orthostatic tachycardia, which means when you stand up, your heart rate speeds up and your blood pressure doesn't really change. That is another manifestation of ACE2 deficiency. Um, And then there's a third pattern, which I haven't seen that much. And and by the way, for 40 years with all of my patients, I check their pulse and blood pressure lying down and standing, looking at changes and using that to interpret what's happening with this person's autonomic nervous system. Some people with long COVID, um, when they go from lying to standing, have an increase in their blood pressure with or without a change in heart rate. That's unusual. Ordinarily, when you stand up, the top number in your blood pressure, the systolic pressure drops. The bottom number comes up a little bit. That's the diastolic. And that's your body's autonomic nervous system responding to the stress of gravity. I mean, if it didn't respond, you would just pass out, all your blood would pool on your feet. But what I've seen is that the systolic pressure goes up instead of down and the diastolic pressure goes up too much, more than is normal. And what that indicates is that the sympathetic nervous system is overreacting to the stress of standing. it's a somewhat different manifestation of this overreaction than POTS, but it, it can occur. And that is also a manifestation of ACE2 deficit. All right, let's, let's continue. So uh, Trudy, one, Trudy Wonder, are, are you seeing any, we have lots of questions. So are you okay. seeing any uh, neuro, neuromuscular conditions arising such as GI dysfunction, dysmotility? And if so, what, what are your thoughts about diagnosis and root cause? Okay, well, okay, that, there are a couple of links that need to be make, yeah. made there. <laughs> okay. If you're talking about neuromuscular in the gut, that's one thing, because that's the autonomic nervous system, versus neuromuscular 
in the peripheral body, in the muscles. And as Diana mentioned, there are a lot of people who develop muscle pain. Mm. And as part of the fatigue syndrome, there can be um, certainly muscle weakness and muscle fatigue, and that's related to mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, lactic acid builds up. Now that happens in CFSME also. We're also, let me just add, Dr. Gallant, we're seeing um, a huge amount of muscle wasting, muscle atrophy, which would mm. also, seems to also point to mitochondrial dysfunction. Right. But I mean, we're seeing that really across the board. Right. Well, of course, some of that might also be deconditioning and inactivity. Yeah, right. Uh, but this right. is... Yeah, it's definitely distinct, I would... It's different. Okay. And there also may be a hormonal basis for it because that virus... ACE2 is high, at least in men, is highly expressed in the testicles. The virus enters, infects testicles. It can reduce testosterone output. We're seeing which, a function, absolutely. And yeah, so, and that will impact, that, will, that, that can contribute to muscle wasting. So, and plus inflammation causes muscle wasting. That, that is, that's one of the cardinal signs of inflammation is loss of muscle protein uh, due to um, certain proteins that are produced by the immune system, interleukin-1. Um, and um, so, uh, but, but I think this is a different question. I think- Yeah, um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just sharing and let, let's continue. It's okay. Um, well, well, let me just answer that. Of it, course. I'm please. sorry, yeah. If you're asking about dysmotility in the GI tract, GI symptoms are very common. I can't say that I've seen um, the kind of dysmotility in long COVID that I've seen in people who have chronic Lyme disease, where it's really neurologic. Maybe this hasn't been, maybe that takes a longer time to develop. Mostly it's reversible and it's related to changes in the microbiome. Okay. Terrific. Someone just asked about diet changes in, yeah. in relation to that. Is that something you can talk about? Sure, I'd love to talk about it. Um, the diet that I favor is a diet that has been shown to um, uh, raise ACE2 levels, um, improve the quality and nature of the gut microbiome, um, and actually make people get less sick when they have acute COVID. And that, I mean, there shouldn't be any surprise about that. It's a plant-based diet high in fiber in polyphenols and flavonoids, omega-3 fats. What has gotten popularized over the past 20 years is an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and and um, now not everybody can follow that diet. So, but, but that's the one that I like to start with. Um, there also may be some benefit to intermittent fasting, which um, balances the system that ACE2 is part of. I am not a fan of low carbohydrate diets for long COVID. They're very dehydrating. They can aggravate POTS. Um, and, um, and this amazing study that was done, a cross-sectional study looking at people who had had COVID. These were healthcare workers. And you, you might've seen this. It came out of Hopkins, Stanford, Columbia, and Harvard. Um, and basically, they looked at healthcare workers in six different countries um, who had survived COVID-19 and they, they gauged how severe, they looked at their pre-illness diet using uh, validated questionnaires. Um, the year before they got COVID, what was their diet like? And how, did they, what was the likelihood that they got either mild or severe, mild to moderate or severe COVID? And people who, the more vegetables you ate, the, the lower the risk of your having severe COVID. And the group that was the most adversely affected by COVID were these healthcare workers who had been on low carb diets. So it wasn't about sugar. It was really, a, a, it was about eating more vegetables, including the starchy vegetables. So uh, I, I do, and I think, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the polyphenols in the diet. I think those are really protective. What do you think about probiotics? Well, I, I use them a lot. And there are four different probiotics that I recommend to my patients. Um, one is there is a probiotic that actually 
is antiviral. It comes from Russia, was developed by um, Soviet scientists, I think actually Ukrainian scientists about 45 years ago. Um, and um, I found out about it incidentally through a patient of mine who had benefited from it. Um, it's, a for, it's a soil derived organism called Bacillus subtilis and it's a particular strain, B7091 or two. Um, it's available in the US um, under the name Tundrix because it comes from Iberian tundra. I've seen some really great responses to it. The most consistent have been people who have GI symptoms with COVID or with long or post COVID respond very well in, in general in the yeah. patients I've given it to. Um, and, but I had been using it for about three or four years before the pandemic, um, testing out its impact on people who had had different kinds of infections, parasitic infections and hadn't really recovered. And I was pretty impressed with it. Um, the, uh, I like lactobacilli and I really like fermented foods uh, if the person can tolerate them because those increase the activity of the type of T cell that we wanna boost. Um, and that's been shown in people with cancer. Um, it helps the response to the cancer immunotherapy. Um, so I use, I like lactobacilli for that purpose. They're sort of the, they're the fourth component that I'll turn, that I'll look at for cementing whatever gains we get. And I particularly like lactobacillus plantarum. That's the one that comes from plants. It's found in sauerkraut and kimchi. Um, and uh, has very strong immune support, supportive effects that have been tested in uh, different kinds of conditions, surgery, acute pancreatitis. Um, and, uh, and then there are two specific strains that I recommend, bec not because of what they do directly, but because in controlled studies, they have been shown to increase the level of the particular important bacterial species that's depleted most by COVID-19. That's a species most people have never heard of and you can't get it as a probiotic. It's called Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. And don't even bother about trying to remember the name. Um, and, you know, we're trying to figure out how to spell it. Um, but um, there's a particular bifidobacterium, um, which if you look it up, it's, you can find it under the, under the name BB536. Um, that's been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects and raise the levels of this bacterium. And there's another soil-derived organism called Bacillus coagulans um, that, that's done the same thing. So I'll, use, uh, I'll usually stagger them, start with the Tundrix, then use the BB536 or the Bacillus coagulans, and then after two or three weeks, move over to Lactobacillus plantarum. Should uh, people get with uh, should people with long COVID get uh, long COVID get boosters? That's a really good question, and there is no simple answer to it. Some people with long COVID do really well when they get vaccinated. I, I mean, I've seen people who had long COVID and then they got the first dose or the second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine and all their symptoms cleared up. And, and that's been reported. We don't know why that happens. Is it because that immune boost allowed them to clear the virus or was it just shaking up their immune system in some way? Um, there are a lot of potential explanations. I don't think anyone's looking at the mechanisms there. But I have seen people with long COVID who got much worse after being vaccinated. Um, can, I, can I just say something? Yeah, of course. Um, this is actually a topic that we published with Yale Medicine on with Akiko Iwasaki and Harlan Krumholz. Um, about a, a year and a half ago, we found that approximately 55, 56% of our respondents had symptomatic relief after having gotten the primary vaccine, not the booster. This was back with the primary vaccine series. Um, that does not mean that those that was sustained relief um, because it was not a longitudinal study. 15% were worse, some of them considerably worse, and the rest were the same. Um, so just adding that in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of close to my experience. I will say that the people that I've seen that I know of who got better had pretty much sustained 
relief. Now, sometimes they wouldn't get any additional relief with the next dose of the vaccine. And, um, and one of them actually, um, his, uh, his primary physician said to him, he didn't want him to get a booster because he'd had a, about 100 patients in his practice with long COVID who got worse after the booster. So he was, you know, so he, he held off on that. Um, of, of the patients that have been, were my patients before or when they first got COVID and followed the, the high polyphenol protocol, resveratrol, curcumin, vitamin D that I we have been recommending for over two years for treating as part of the treatment for acute COVID. The incidence of long COVID in those people is under 1%. Now that's not a controlled study. It's my experience, but whatever their risk factors were, they, and I, I try to, fo I follow them very closely. I, I really try to follow up and ask them, you know, you, you sure you're just the same as you were before COVID. Um, there are very few people that over a few weeks do not return to their baseline uh, pre-COVID. Um, so I do think that it matters if you sustain ACE2 and um, in, in the recovery period. The, um, so I, I don't have the experience that would allow, I mean, so the long COVID people that are seeing me are pretty sick and pretty complicated. So I, I don't have the kind of experience that would allow me to come to the conclusion that my patient's primary physician did, that he was just seeing too many people who were getting worse with their long COVID after the booster. So I think the word is out on that. Is The word's not in on that as yet. Great, well, thank you. Diana, you know, I would love for you to take just a couple of minutes, a minute or so, and tell us how we can, uh, you know, we have just a few minutes left, how we can support Survivor Poor and those of us who would like to make contributions, um, you know, if you if you don't mind, just just give us a little a, a minute or two on that because that's something I really feel is important. We get in tonight. Oh, I don't mind at all, and thank you very much for bringing that up. Although I don't want to take any time away from anyone's last minute questions that they can um, jam in. But um, Survivor Corps is uh, remains the largest COVID movement in the world. And we are sitting on the largest database on non-hospitalized patients in the world. And when you think about why does that matter, it matters because where do we get our data from? We get our data from electronic health records. If your electronic health record wasn't coded properly and we didn't even have an ICD-10 code for the long COVID until a year ago, and we worked really hard to, make, to get that ICD-10 code, um, but if you go to the dentist and you lose your teeth post COVID from those that vas those microclots in your you know jaw vasculature, I assure you it's not being coded for long COVID. Um, and so if you put lousy data in, you get lousy data out. What we are able to do is bring the patient lived experiences to the table and share that information with the physicians and scientists who are doing the work. And so we are the ones who told the world about COVID toes. We're the ones who told the world about dentistry issues, about um, erectile dysfunction. I mean, you name it. Um, in July of 2020, when the CDC increased their symptom list from four to 11, we put out a list of well over 100 symptoms and it would be three times as long now, but it was- yeah, 100 symptoms? Over 100 symptoms, that was in July of 2020. Um, so we have consistently been there at the table, not just lobbying the government for more funds and not just more funds, but better use of those funds. Um, we advise the NIH, the White House, you name it. And we are there. Our website um, houses the only dynamic map of post-COVID care centers in the country. They exist in 48 of 50 states. They are not all built equally, but they do exist in 48 out of 50 states. Kansas and South Dakota, I'm coming at you. Um, but you know, we go to survivorcorps.com, survivor C O R P S, like the Marine Corps or Peace Corps sign up for our newsletter. We um, regularly, we fill cohorts um, for studies and trials overnight. So we save those 
scientists the time and we save the patients that time because nobody has time to spare. And um, if you're sick, we want to get you better. Um, we have one mission and that's to save as many lives as possible. That's it. Um, and by we are able to create efficiencies in this system to make things go faster, to bring people the relief that they need, and specifically to the symptoms that they are experiencing, which might not be the same ones that scientists in their labs or the clinician who might see a few long COVID patients a week. Um, we are looking at 250,000 of them on a daily basis. And so we are able to see signals of what is working, what's helping people, what is not, um, where are the concerns and being that amplified voice. So um, we appreciate you know, every, every penny that can go towards keeping that website up and keeping it active. Uh, it, it is a tremendous service and it would be, you know, horrible for it to have to go away if we can't maintain the amount of funding that's necessary to keep the lights on. So uh, please yeah. join us. We, we, we um, unquestionably, I think it's a, this, what you guys are doing is really the kind of community that both those who are suffering with the disease and those of us who are blessed right now, maybe we're not. And so... It's very easy. Life is complicated. And, you know, you, you know, when it's not happening to you, it's very easy to lose sight of how important it is to support uh, the work that Diane is doing. And I Dr. do not have I, long COVID, by the way. I do not have long COVID. But yeah, so I think it's God goes on. yeah, so definitely uh, visit the website. And um, I, I also want to say that um, a, anyone who has questions that may be you want to direct to us there'll be there'll be uh, a recap email we'll be very interested in, on a one-to-one -one basis people at the team leadership at totos very interested in helping to answer questions and he, and dr galan galan uh, was you're just awesome uh to have a chance to hear just a, a little bit of the of the work that you're doing and if 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 people want to learn more about your work, where would you recommend that they could go to uh, get a, a little more acquainted with the, with what you're, uh, what you're doing? Well, I do have a website, um, drgallum.com. Uh, I am trying to update the information that's there. It just takes time. Um, I spend most of my time treating patients and most of the rest of it researching COVID and long COVID. Um, so actually, Getting the writing done, it, you know, takes a backseat to those things. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Well, if anyone wants to volunteer to <laughs> to help help you <laughs> with any of that work, um, they should reach out to you because um, it, it, this is really important stuff. On behalf of the T Totus Medical team. Um, the Alchemist Kitchen, we, we, we encourage you, all of you come visit us in Soho. We have a great apothecary and an elixir bar and really lovely uh, environment to connect and engage. And, and on, on that note, we want to wish all of you a blessed rest of your week. And, uh, and thank you so much for joining today. We appreciate it. Good night, guys. Thank you.